Hey, good morning. How you doing this morning? <laughs> you are, uh, you didn't wake up and realize you're going to a recovery meeting this morning. <laughs> it's okay. You're in the right place. You're at Southcrest Church. It's Sunday morning. It's not Tuesday night. Um, it's okay. <laughs> I know you may be a little freaked out by what you've seen this morning, but um, my name is Ben. Uh, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I struggle with codependency and low self-worth. <laughs> hey, family. Um, I just wanted to welcome you this morning and uh, tell you that it is my joy and privilege to be able to talk just for a few moments um, about recovery and what it looks like. Um, recovery is something that is from the Bible. Jesus is the reason that we have recovery. Um, it's not just something that happens on Tuesday night. It's actually part of the Christian wall. Everybody that is a Christian experiences some sort of recovery. Um, some of us choose not to to have recovery. We, we choose to hide some things in our life, but we're going to get into that today. Uh, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too soon. Uh, my goal today is to, uh, to try to help you see that recovery is basically the joy uh, of, of uh, sorry, <laughs> recovery is basically the joy of recovering what was lost. Um, and I think that Jesus knew that every single one of us would lose something. And so he taught in a parable in Luke chapter 15, which is where we're going to be today for just a few minutes. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, you want to open up there, that would be cool. And uh, yeah, well, let's just get to the text. I'll, I'll just go ahead and get there. Uh, so Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 8, it says, Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp? sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. No, this is not a, uh, a how-to guide on how to find lost money. Obviously, this is a story of joy of recovering what was lost. Um, and in the presence, when, when Jesus said this parable, when he told the story, um, there were sinners, there were tax collectors, and there were Pharisees. So there were three different groups of people. None of those people necessarily liked each other. So he told a story that every single person could relate to, the story of loss. And I can relate to uh, the story of loss a good bit in my life. Uh, every day, I think that I'm losing my mind. Um, <laughs> recently, my family recovered from, uh, from COVID-19. Amy had COVID, and yesterday we were able to break free of the quarantine, which is so incredible to be with you. Yeah, we are healthy. Um, but as dad, trying to cook all the meals, do virtual school, trying to work all at the same time, I felt like I was going crazy. <laughs> I felt like I was losing my mind for real. Um, but I was reminded of a story. Um, when Amy and I were just a few years into marriage, she went on a girl's trip to Panama City. And she is not the type of person that would throw football or really play on the beach. We like to lounge and just chill on the beach. But her girlfriends kind of talked her into throwing the football. So they're in about two feet of water. And I know it, the world probably slowed down to like a standstill the moment the football hit her ring finger and her engagement ring just kind of fell off into about two feet of water. And so you know, immediately they start looking for it. And she calls me about two hours later, almost unable to even talk. She's sobbing so much, you know, because something that was so valuable to her, um, she lost it. And unfortunately, we were never able to find that ring. And um, I was thinking about another loss in our life was uh, a couple of years after that, we decided we wanted to have children. And we had a hard time getting pregnant. And we finally got pregnant for the first time. Uh, we have three beautiful kids, by the way. And we, um, we got to about week 14, and we thought, man, we are in the clear. We can finally let our parents know and our friends. And so we started sharing the joy. And then just a few days later, we lost that baby. And so, like, we have experienced loss in our life. And I know I'm not immune to loss, and I know that every single person here, nobody is immune to loss. We, we have things that we lose. And I'm kind of jealous of the lady in this story because she found her coin. And when she found her tangible lost item, she was happy. But it was kind of hard to find happiness in those moments in our lives where we experience loss. Um, and so I'm finding myself asking Jesus, well, Jesus, what happens when you lose something that's valuable to you that you can't find? 
And I think that the answer is in the form of healing. Like when you have something that's lost that you can't find and you hand that over to God, he can produce healing in your life that would give you the same joy that this lady had. And so I bet I'm not the only person in this room that's experienced loss. Loss looks very different uh, for all of us. Um, sometimes we have uh, had someone break up with us or we've lost some love or if we've lost joy or friendship, um, we've lost hope. Something's happened in our life and we've lost hope. We've all experienced these things. Maybe somebody you trusted took advantage of you or abused you and you lost your innocence. These things happen. Sometimes we lose our happiness. Sometimes we get caught up and putting all of our energy into something we realized was a waste of time. and We lost time that we can never get back. Or if you're like me and you struggle with uh, your self-worth, you lose your self-esteem when somebody makes fun of you. Or maybe you've lost your way in life or you've lost your peace. And we all have these losses in our lives. And these losses in our recovery program, we call our hurts. These things hurt us and they produce certain feelings that we have, right? And sometimes these feelings are feelings of despair, or you become resentful of that person that hurt you, or you have feelings of anxiety, sadness. Maybe you've become angry. You have feelings of helplessness. Maybe you've become cynical, or maybe you're frustrated. We have all these things. And when this happens in life, and it may, it may start like a little small thing. Maybe it's a huge hurt that's happened to your life, but we all have these things. Would you agree? I think we all have these things. We have hurts. We have feelings. These feelings turn into hangups in our lives because we don't quite know what to do with these things. So we like to make a collection. We pull out our little jar and we put all of our hangups and we put all of our hurts in here. And this is called grief. We all have grief. This is our grief jar. And so when this starts to get full, opening this, talking about this, feeling this, is hard and we don't want to do it. So a lot of times we tend to hide this. Ben, how are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm great. But I may not be great because my grief jar is kind of full lately. And when this starts to get full, we just try to figure out how to get through the day. I just want to get through tomorrow. Can I just get through the day? And so we start to have certain actions that help us with this right here. We call this coping. If I could just cope with what was in this jar, maybe I'll feel a little bit better today. And as you begin to cope and cope and cope, it doesn't look anything at all like healing. It just looks like dealing and coping and living in this grief. We start to develop actions that we do over and over and over, and they become habits in our lives. And so some of these habits may look like if our pain is rooted in love or relationships, we may become manipulative or controlling of other people. If something has happened to you, if your pain is rooted in abuse, you may start to condemn yourself, denying that the past abuse actually affects your present circumstance. If you're like me and you struggle with codependency, you will assume the responsibility of other people's feelings and behaviors. You minimize and alter, and you deny how you truly feel. Maybe it starts to present itself in eating disorders where you have an unhealthy obsession with your body shape. You have compulsive eating or you start purging food when you feel bad, or you turn to food to ease pain or comfort or find comfort. Maybe you start to experience lots of anger and you act out in anger. And a lot of people think that when you struggle with anger, that you are a violent lash out uh, person, but that's simply not the case. Most people that struggle with anger um, keep it on the inside. It's like a cancer on the inside. You may find that you act kind to people, but you feel bitter and frustrated on the inside and you shut down and withdraw from people who you're displeased with. Maybe you struggle with chemical addictions. You have the inability to deal with life on life's terms. It's just simply too hard or you have little control over the amount that you consume. Maybe you struggle with sexual addictions and you use sex as a way to escape or you have inability to resist sex or sexual images or maybe it takes in the place of gambling. The, the thing is, is that these are just coping mechanisms. These are things and actions we do that we're trying to solve this problem, but it never works. These simply become more hurts 
which turn into more hangups, which start to go back into our jar. And this is the cycle of insanity. This is crazy because we continue to do the same thing over and over and over, hoping that we could have a different result. This is one path that we often take, a lot of us take it, but there is a different way. I think Jesus told us the different way in the story in Luke chapter 15. Basically, I wanna wanna pull that out one more time. Luke chapter 15. He says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a light, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. Basically, she does whatever it takes to find that lost coin. She does whatever it takes to recover the loss. She does whatever it takes to recover. What it looks like for us is we're not gonna find these things. These are intangible things that we've experienced loss in our life, but we can find healing. And I know that when you start to open this jar, which is hard to do, and you start to take these things out and you share them with other people. This is why recovery works for us. It's because it gives us the place and the people that we can share these hurtful and these painful things with. Matthew 5, 4 says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Mourning is the process of taking what's in your grief jar and getting it out, right? So we know that if we can mourn these losses, we'll start to experience healing. James 5, 16 says, If you confess your faults to each other and pray for each other, you'll be healed. See, God can forgive things that happen to us, but only when we share them do we experience healing in our lives. And healing is possible. I've experienced it. I've experienced healing in the area of codependency and low self-worth. Sometimes it's a daily struggle. Sometimes those struggles are a little more uh, than other days, but it definitely, healing definitely happens. And there's a joy that happens when you find what is lost, when you recover. And so in a few minutes, we're gonna get to hear three stories from people who have been working their recovery, and they're gonna come up here and tell you a little about about their joy and some of the things that's happened in their life since they started working in recovery. Um, But I wanna read the rest of the parable. It says, and when she finds it, she keeps it to herself. No, she doesn't do that. When she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's joy that happens when you get to tell your story. You ever eat at a restaurant and the food's so good? Like if you go to 714 and you get the pork belly tacos, they will blow your mind. And then you text your best friend, oh my gosh, you got to eat these tacos. There was a certain amount of joy that you had while you're eating, but it wasn't complete. You got to tell somebody about it. So this morning, we get to experience some of the joy of recovery by hearing some stories. And so I want you to give us a, a warm welcome to our three brave friends who are going to come up here and share for a few minutes. Good morning, church family. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ whose struggles are with self-worth, self-control over my food addiction, grief, but I have victory over denial. I'm Gina. Gina. I grew up in South Florida in a farming community and military community. I'm the baby of six children. Although my mom raised us in church, our family was dysfunctional from my first memory. My mom, a Christian, my dad, a non-believer alcoholic who lived in the bar, and my brothers who were on drugs, drinking at all ages and getting brought home by the police. The good that I remember is mom taking the boys to a recovery unit called The Seed. This is a place like a revival on steroids. I believe my oldest brother was saved during one of these gatherings. Denial in my life started very young. I always claimed to be a twin, don't know why, and for years I carried around baggage of shame, guilt, because I allowed a cousin to sexually abuse me. Dad quit allowing mom to take us to church after we moved out to the country. I had to make new friends. I became angry, always acting out, fighting with others, and turning only to friends through my whole entire high school. I'd do anything to be with my friends instead of being at home. It was in 1990 when I met what I thought was the love of my life. Shortly after we met, He joined the Marine Corps and we were married in 91 and had two children. 
I always felt there was infidelity going on, but could never prove it. And when I confronted him, he always made me feel like I was the one with the insecurities. I would do anything to keep him focused on our marriage. And in 2004, when I gave my life into the hands of Christ, that my security started to lift off. See, for years, I allowed myself to believe the lies I would tell me. Lies that I was no good, I was unworthy of love and respect because I didn't respect myself and couldn't see the good that God created. I denied myself the freedom to live the life God had planned for me. Once I allowed Christ to begin to work in me, I began to walk different, talk different, and even look different. I prayed for God to change both of us and strengthen our marriage and family. Even though I gave my life over to Christ, my marriage was not promised. Six years later, a divorce was filed and I found myself lifted of a world of stress that I had been carrying around while I was trying to be somebody that I really wasn't. I wanted happiness and I found that in my salvation and my relationship with the Lord. Through my years of denial, I allowed myself to go through a 20 year marriage, denying myself happiness. I denied myself freedom from hurt, pain, and self-worth. But most importantly, I denied that I needed Christ to help carry me through my hurts, habits, and hangups that I had developed over the years. I was in denial of the family sexual abuse and denial that I deserved the many blessings that God had for me. I thought I could just try harder, act better, look better, be a better woman, wife, mom, friend, coworker, then everything would be just different. Crazy as it seems, I wasn't lacking in any of those areas. I was pushing myself to be the best that I could be, going above and beyond all I could do, and I still felt that I wasn't good enough. On May 25th, 2017, the Lord led me into a relationship back with a friend I had hurt seven years prior. That morning, I was journaling, and the Lord prompted me to reach out to my friend and apologize for the way that I had ended a relationship. I was working principle six, evaluate all my friendships, offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me, and make amends for the harm I've caused others when possible, except when to do so would harm them or others. I obeyed the Lord's command. After I apologized to him in 2017, we began dating. I obeyed, whoops, sorry. After I apologized, you see, God led me to a place called, led him to a place called Celebrate Recovery. That began to, the molding ground for him, for the man that I was praying for. So in 2018, when Southcrest decided to launch CR, my husband and I signed up to serve. I didn't have any addictions, but as required, I took my first step study to serve others. What I experienced was God showing up in ways, showing me where I needed him the most and others. So by working my inventory, God showed up and showed off, guiding me as I assessed my life as he allowed me to live the life of denial. Hebrews 12, one, let us run the, run the race with perseverance, the race that's marked out for us. On Sunday evenings, I am now a co-leader of a step study. I'm, if there's anyone here this morning struggling with denial, you're not alone. I took up my cross, carried it step by step by working through a step study. I allowed Christ into my life daily and watch the 12 steps and eight principles mold me into the God, the person God intended me to be, loving to self and others. This doesn't mean I will not live without a hurt, habit, or a hangup, but it will help me accept the way that things are in my life and work through them with Christ by my side. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Thank you for letting me share. Hey guys, um, good morning. My name is Matt Key. Uh, most of you guys probably know who I am or have seen me around, uh, but very few of you probably know my life story because I've spent 
my life, uh, covering up and hiding the painful details of my life, uh, which started with uh, a lifelong battle with food and weight control issues, which led to um, low self-worth, low self-esteem, and that contributed to a 27-year unhealthy relationship with alcohol. And this is my story. Amen. Amen. For most of my life, my self-worth and confidence were determined by the number on a scale. Most times, the number told me that I was not good enough. I joke and tell people that I've been on a diet my whole life, but it's not actually a joke at all. Growing up, I was reluctant to put myself in situations that would draw attention to me. I was very hesitant to play sports, but I was very good at most sports and, and uh, good at most sports and very good at baseball. Uh, at age 13, the stress of being good enough became overwhelming and I quit. Where most people saw a tremendous athlete, I saw a chubby little red-headed freckle-faced boy with a funny voice. I knew Jesus at an early age, but I guess I really only knew him on the surface. Otherwise, I would have known what my real identity was in him. My relationship with Jesus would come much later in life, but that's when I would need him the most. In my teen years, I found myself at 220 pounds, again, the number on the scale, and telling myself that enough was enough, and then embarking on a starvation diet with relentless exercise to find myself at a sickly 135 pounds with anorexic and bulimic tendencies. And then one day I found the miracle cure. I never knew that confidence and courage could be found in 12 ounce cans and bottles. It was instant confidence and I found myself and I found something that I was really good at and practice made perfect. I practiced it a lot. Drinking became not only my self-prescribed medication, but also my identity, and I embraced that, that identity for most of my adult life. For 27 years, destructive behaviors were normal, legal issues, marriage issues, and a strained relationship with my kids. It all changed in April 2019 after a day of heavy drinking and trying to lie myself out of trouble with my wife again but she was not having it anymore. She was done and was prepared to take the kids and leave. I've had many rock bottoms, but this time I chose to quit digging. To save my family, I reluctantly agreed to marriage counseling and attending Celebrate Recovery. After a few weeks of CR and a few sessions of counseling, something seemed different this time around. I was really loving the, the man, the husband, and the father that I was becoming. For the first time, I could see my life without alcohol, and it was okay. My marriage started to heal, and the trust was beginning to be rebuilt, and my children saw joy and happiness return to their daddy. On my hands and knees, I told Jesus, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right, and ask him back into my heart and to reveal Um, and for him to reveal my true identity. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's masterpiece. He revealed to me that I had it wrong all those years. I would like to tell you that we lived happily ever after, but, I, but there were few setbacks that would wreck my progress, our progress. Each setback was more difficult than the last, but God was teaching me a valuable lesson each time to rely on him. I believe the relapses were necessary for God to get me to where I am today. In August of 2019, I signed up for the step study being led by an incredible man who would become my sponsor. The step study allowed me to dig deep inside my soul to gain the understanding as to why I was so jacked up. What a wonderful and scary way to get to know the stranger within me and start healing the wounds that were festering my whole life. Step one was the game changer. As I got out of my denial and I finally admitted I was powerless over my addiction and my compulsive behaviors and my life was unmanageable. 
I understand what Paul was going through in Romans 7, 18 when he said, For I know nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Only God was able to do for me in a relatively short period of time what I was not able to do for myself for 27 years. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. He loved me as much then as he does now, but he loved me too much to let me stay there. And no, I'm not the man that I want to be, but I'm no longer that man that I used to be. I no longer live my life in despair with anxiety, guilt, shame, remorse, and regret. Today I live my life with confidence, joy, excitement, and adventure. I hope the peace and the freedom that I enjoy today is encouragement to all of you. I tell my story in hopes that someone may be encouraged to change their story. That a marriage can begin healing or a broken relationship restored. The peace and the freedom that I've been able to enjoy is not only possible, it's available. And we have a tremendous resource that meets every Tuesday right here at South Crest called Celebrate Recovery. Change is hard but it is so worth it. And if you think you have an area in your life, a hurt, a hang-up, or a habit that needs healing, come see us on Tuesday. It would be an honor to love on you and encourage you. This is my story, and it's been an honor to share it with you. Thank you for letting me share. could get up here without crying but <laughs> um, hi I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ and God is healing me from codependency anxiety depression and trust issues my name is Rebecca, hey, Rebecca. Hi, guys. I'm grateful to share my story of healing and growth that's happened through the grace of God and celebrate recovery I've spent much of my life feeling like I wasn't good enough ashamed of my struggles and fearful that my struggles would be found out because of this, I relied on my ability to control things, hoping it would keep me from getting hurt more. My codependent tendencies, or trying to fix others, started at a young age for me. As a teenager, I formed a few unhealthy relationships that I now realize were codependent relationships. I tried to help others by trying to control because I didn't like seeing people struggle. I had no idea that my role in these relationships was an unhealthy one. I met my best friend and my husband in college. My codependent ways continued in this relationship as well. I saw warning signs that alcohol was a problem, but I chose to ignore them. I thought that once we got married, it would be okay because I could fix him. I prayed for years that God would change my husband, not realizing that he was changing me slowly. During this time, I continued to try to control my husband, which only made things worse. I too used alcohol to cope with my unhappiness, and I chose to focus on the speck in my husband's eye and paid no attention to the log in my own eye, Matthew 7, 3. I realize now that by con trying to control what my husband did, um, by doing that, I was playing God instead of trusting him. I lived my life trying to hide my personal and marital struggles from my family, my church, and many of my friends. I was overwhelmed with shame, isolation, and fear of judgment all the while attending church every Sunday and serving. I did my best to wear my mask and to make everything look like it was okay. Two years ago, my marriage and home life had finally hit rock bottom. I couldn't continue to hide how bad things had gotten. As a last resort, I began to attend Celebrate Recovery for a second time. I had attended Celebrate Recovery before, but thought that um, I could handle things on my own. I was wrong. Trying to do things my way instead of God's way only resulted in hurt and disappointment. I was burdened with worry and guilt. I was completely broken and on the verge of leaving my marriage. My healing began when I worked the steps in my step study. It was such a relief to give up my need for control when I worked step two. I came to believe a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Philippians 2.13 says, for it is good for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. 
A huge burden was lifted from me when I accepted the fact that trusting God in his plan for my life was so much better than doing it my way. During this time, God made me realize that I had to focus on doing my part to be obedient to him instead of blaming all my problems on my husband. Then I started, uh, when, I start, when I shared my deepest hurts at Celebrate Recovery, they lost their control over me. This brought unexplainable healing and freedom. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. James 5.16 I wish I could say that my life was perfect after first stepping into CR, but that isn't really how life works. My CR family was always there for me as I worked through my hurts, hangups, and habits. They listened without judgment and they supported me. Things were getting much better in my marriage and in my relationship with God, I felt peace and joy. Then the pandemic hit. The isolation and fear were crippling. My anxiety and stress led to depression. I prayed for God to take this from me, but that wasn't his plan. God carried me through this time, and he used it to help me realize once again how much I really needed him. 2 Corinthians 12.9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I felt that God had a plan and would use my struggles uh, for his glory if I let him. I wondered if God allowed this to happen so that I could bring encouragement or comfort to someone else struggling with anxiety and depression. The thought of this made me uncomfortable, and it still does but I know that I am not growing when I'm in a place of comfort. During this struggle, God also brought healing in my marriage. He allowed my husband to be strong for me during this time. This helped rebuild my trust and brought us closer. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 says, Be glad about this, even though it may now be necessary for you to be sad for a while because of the many kinds of trials you suffer. Their purpose is to prove that your faith is genuine. Even gold, which can be destroyed, is tested by fire, and so your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must also be tested so that it may endure. God continues to reveal areas in my life that need to be refined, and I'm grateful for that. God has given me so much through my recovery over the last two years. I'm learning to be patient and trust God's timing. He has given me unexplainable peace when I need it the most. And I'm especially thankful for the changes that God has made in my marriage as a result of us both working through recovery. We will celebrate 25 years of marriage this year, and we are in a completely different place from where we were before coming to, back to celebrate recovery, because we're different people. I want you to know that whatever your struggle is, you are not alone. God will provide healing if you let him. The first step is to take off your mask of denial or shame and experience the freedom that comes with giving your struggle to God. He wants to carry your burdens, but you have to give them to him. Working the biblical steps and celebrate recovery isn't easy, but it is so worth it. I pray that my story brings comfort and hope to someone here today. If you're ready to give your hurts to God and experience the healing that can come with it, join us on a Tuesday night at Celebrate Recovery. Thank you for letting me share. Wasn't that awesome? So I just want to ask you, what's in your grief jar? And what do you need to deal with? Because we all have some. We all have this jar in our lives. See, we get so wrapped up in trying to change these, thinking that that's the answer. But these started right back here, and it's in this jar. So anyway, I want to invite you uh, to come to Celebrate Recovery on Tuesday night. It is completely confidential and anonymous. We never share who comes to Celebrate Recovery. You say, Ben, who's there Tuesday night? I can't tell you, a bunch of awesome people. <laughs> um, but all of us are there for the same reason. We wanna get better. We wanna be healthy. We wanna have recovery and joy and happiness in our life. And we know that God can restore that for us. If you've experienced, you've been walking with the Lord a long time and you've experienced this joy and recovery, I want to ask you to think about one thing. Imagine if you could give these tools to a younger generation. Imagine if our kids... Sorry. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to cry. I always cry. As soon as I had kids, it's like the water faucets got turned on and everything just makes me cry now. Um, but a lot of these hurts that happen are like, that happen when we're young, you know? We have what's called pre-covery. It's celebration place. It's the landing. It's for elementary and all the way through high school. 
and we're looking for six couples. You don't have to know anything about recovery. Not yet. You'll learn. (laughs) But our kids need this in our community. I needed this. I needed this when I was young. We have the opportunity to really make a difference. Anyway, so through this next song that we're about to worship with, um, Graves in the Gardens, because only God can do that. You can't do that. You can't turn your life around, but God can. But man, think about what it takes to bring this to our church so that we can start a recovery program for both our young kids and our teenagers. So let me pray before we go into worship.